I uh, want to share a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dustin Hinton. Um, I am from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I go to New Life Community Church. Um, I'll share a little bit about my testimony uh, during my, my teaching. Um, but I got saved in 2005 when I was in college. Um, and God's just been doing crazy things with my life ever since. Um, but two years ago, uh, we were at New Life, and me and a couple other guys were thinking, let's get this wild idea of planting a church. You all are pretty familiar with that idea up here, laboring hard. It's not an easy thing to plant a church. It really isn't. And um, we planted one right there in Cedar Rapids. We were just very, could easily have just been called another congregation of New Life, but we called it Regeneration Church and, and hit the road. And for two years, we labored hard um, trying to witness to, uh, to people in other parts of Cedar Rapids and other demographics. During the time, I was also working uh, full-time as a project manager for an engineering company. Um, so uh, I was working 40-ish hours a week uh, in a secular role while also trying to run a church plant. After two years of laboring hard and seeing some challenges along the way, we had decided that we were going to close doors. And fortunately, we had a really wonderful church, a New Life Community Church, to go back to. And so we've been back there. Um, I was recognized as a pastor for that church plant. And um, so I've been setting up shop back at New Life Community Church just trying to figure out what God's going to do for me and what God wants me to do for him. Um, I'm not actually a recognized elder at New Life Community Church right now because in the two years I was gone, there's been a lot of new people there that don't know me very well. Um, so right now I'm, I'm setting up shop in music ministry, and God's been using that a lot and, and encouraging and the reason why I share all of that with you is because this year has been one of the most difficult years of my life. It really, really has. And to be honest, you have, hopefully you can, as a, as a Christian, you can recognize that there are those moments. You have really dark moments. And those are usually the moments you have in private, not when you're sitting with a bunch of very encouraging, lovely saints. But when you're by yourself, you have those dark moments where you're like, God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can handle this anymore. It's been a difficult year, and I had a lot of those moments. But in those moments, God recognized, uh, God helped me recognize that I need him, that I need him, and helped me see that no matter if I'm heading up a church plant at Regeneration Church or playing in music or even just being with the saints at New Life Community Church, we are on mission. And this mission is a is a really wonderful and challenging experience. and not We don't always know how it's going to work out. We don't always know what it's going to form, it's going to take, but we keep going. And this morning I'm going to be talking about why we do that. Why do we be on mission? What should be our drive to be on mission? And to be carrying the Lord's word and carrying his work into this very dark world full of broken people that need a savior. And through that, what I'm going to be doing, uh, I'll call this Encounters with Christ. I'm going to be highlighting some encounters that some people in the scripture had with their savior. And what kind of profound impact that had on their lives, how it changed them and put them on mission. And through that, we as Christians, saved by Jesus Christ, have a mission that we can be committed to. And I believe that if we've had a real, real encounter with Jesus Christ, we'll want to be on mission. We'll want to be on mission. Why don't we go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump in here into the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I do just thank you so much for your love and your grace. I praise you for this opportunity to be with these saints. I praise you for what you're doing here in Janesville, and I thank you that you're using this church to be a part of that. May these lovely saints be instruments of your will in this city and throughout the world. That is the magnitude, the scope of your power and your mission in this world, and you will use every single one of these saints who love you dearly and recognize you as their Lord and their Savior to do just that to change the world one soul at a time, one person at a time. God, we thank you for being a part of it. We pray you just help us to remember and recognize our encounters with you and perhaps maybe even recognize we haven't had one yet. And may today be the day that we have an encounter with Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
I appreciate an amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. appreciate being excited about God's word. Um, I share this. Let me put this up here. I share this. We being on mission, we're obviously on mission to share with the world the love of Jesus Christ in various forms, whatever it might be. I'm not talking about just going out to the corner, street corner and preaching the word of God, albeit if you're inclined and gifted to do that, by all means, go ahead. Um, that hasn't been my rodeo. Uh, it terrifies me to death. I've done it, and, I, and I'll do it if the Lord asks, but um, it terrifies me. Uh, but sharing even a cup of cold water, reaching out to a neighbor, sharing a meal, a nice gesture. We're all ministering the gospel of love to other people. We're ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ through loving acts of kindness. And the reason why uh, we do that is because we understand Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with him. And we recognize, uh, I at least uh, recognize and, and believe that the, the quality of our gospel witness is directly dependent on our understanding of Jesus Christ. The quality of our gospel witness is directly dependent on how well we know our Savior. That, um, well, I just went, I got to remember to tap this thing every now and again and it will suspend on me. Um, how well we understand our Savior, how well we know him, that's going to directly affect how well we minister his gospel to people, how well we represent him in this world. And today we are going to look at how some people reacted when they met this incredible Savior and what kind of an impact it had on their lives, what kind of impact it had on ours. Perhaps we have had the same experience, or perhaps we haven't. It will give us an, at least an opportunity to reflect on it and ask ourselves, have we had an encounter with Christ? Have we really met our Savior? And what effect did that have on our lives? I uh, ask that you forgive me for not bringing up slides in a hard copy form. I uh, put it on the web, and, and uh, so we're going to do it the old-fashioned way today. I'm going to encourage you to pull out your Bibles. Um, and uh, if you've got electronic devices that you uh, prefer, I don't... I don't know if Dan's a, a guy who says no phones in your church, and if that's the case, you know him better than me, but there you go. If you've got electronic, pull it out electronic as well, but open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Got a little bit of Wisconsin coming out of my nose right now. That joke's not going to get old. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I will in Wisconsin. That's great. Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to look at Isaiah's encounter here. Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now, we're going to read along. Each one of these portions of Scripture is going to be a little lengthy because we're just reading about full encounters. We're not highlighting one uh, command or promise in Scripture, but just highlighting um, encounters uh, so we may have to read along here a little bit, so I encourage you to bear with me as we do that. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Isaiah is having a vision here and seeing the Lord. High and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the, temp filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs. From the altar, when he touched it with his when he touched my mouth with it, he touched my mouth and said, "See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for." Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" And I said, "Here I am. Send me." This is an incredible, incredible story, detail of a vision seeing the Lord. I 
I just want to talk about what Isaiah is seeing here, what he's detailing, the magnitude of what's happening here. He sees a vision. He sees the Lord seated in his throne, high above, exalted, robe filled the whole temple. And in here he sees these seraphs, these angelic beings, these created beings. Now these angelic beings, these are not just mere puppets or uh, you know, random things of no significance here. It says when they were calling, they're speaking to one another, they're calling, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, these powerful beings, it shook. The thresholds, the doorposts, they shook, and the whole temple is filled with smoke. These are awesome beings. And in the magnitude of that power, we can see what they're doing with their wings. With one set of wings, they're flying, and another set, they're covering their faces. The other set, they're covering their feet. They're covering themselves as an act of submission before the Lord. Because these powerful angelic beings know that in the presence of God Almighty, they too need to cover their faces. They too need to cover their feet as an act of submission before the Lord. Awesome beings recognizing an even more awesome and powerful creator God. And as they sing praises to him, they have to humble themselves, humble themselves and cover. And it doesn't take Isaiah long to figure that out. And once Isaiah does, he says, he responds really wonderfully. He says, woe to me. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble because I am an unclean man. I'm a man of unclean lips. I am a wretched, broken human being standing before the Lord God Almighty. And that can't be. That's a problem. He's recognizing in that very moment he has a human condition problem. He's human before God. And these angelic beings that are so much more powerful than him have humbled themselves clean before God. And here he is standing. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. I am broken. I appreciate the water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's right, it's in Wisconsin water. All right. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I am broken. We have a problem. Fortunately, at that point, Isaiah is offered a solution. You see, one of those angelic beings takes a live coal. Uh, with tongs from, the, from what we see as an altar. It's an offering, a burnt offering. There's a live coal there. In that time, you would have had to, um, Isaiah would have been well familiar with the idea that this coal, this live coal from a burnt offering, would have been a sacrifice to atone for sins, right? And this angelic being grabs it and touches it to his lips and responds. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. In that moment, Isaiah is sanctified. He's purified. He's clean. And what we see here is this coal is a type example of Jesus Christ. We see Jesus in the coal. We resonate with that idea. That in this moment, he is saved, not by something he did, but by something someone else did for him. And in that moment, he recognized he's saved. He's purified before the Lord. He now has clean lips. I love the word atoned here. I love that word because it also points to... The same word in 1 John chapter 4, where John writes, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved, his, loved us 
and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So we even see the same word used, atonement, where we recognize that our sins are paid for. They're paid for. So we see this live coal. It's touched to his lips. Isaiah recognizes, hey, I've just been saved. Problem solved. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm before the Lord. I have a problem, and I've been saved. And how does he respond? He's been bailed out. He's fine. And how does he respond? Well, God even gives him an open invitation there. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who will be my witness? Who will speak for me? Who will represent me in this world of unclean lips? And Isaiah didn't wait. He didn't hesitate. Who? Send me. Send me. I'm clean. Send me. He was eager to please the Lord. He was eager to be a part of God's plan. He was eager to respond to that request because he had just been cleaned. He had just been saved. He didn't deserve it. He didn't have to pay for it. And he signed up. I'll give you the rest of my life. I will give you everything that I have. I will represent you. Here I am, God. Send me. And God did. And God did. This incredibly uh, powerful, remarkable uh, exchange that Isaiah had with God, this encounter he had with his Lord, and he was saved by his Savior, turned out to have a, rem a, rem a remarkable uh, life change for Isaiah. Isaiah then became the representative for God amongst his people. Isaiah went and spoke on behalf of the Lord. He was God's mouthpiece to the Jews, in the, to the Israelites during that time. He represented God. And he did it with his life, his whole life. He represented God and spoke on God's behalf. That's the kind of, and that's the kind of impression that having an encounter, a saving encounter with our Lord had on Isaiah. Let's... Let's not camp there too much longer. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on to the next. Let's talk about Peter. Let's fast forward to the New Testament. Let's talk about Peter's encounter with Christ. I love this, uh, this, this exchange that Peter has. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, we'll read there about Peter's encounter with the living Savior Jesus Christ. Starting verse 4, we'll read through through verse 11. When he had finished speaking, that he being Jesus, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they had caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Notice the similarities between Isaiah's experience and Peter's experience. He has an exchange with, with, with Jesus. He recognizes Jesus for who he is and recognizes that he's also got a human condition problem, too. He's a human standing before the Lord, standing before God himself. And he falls too. He says, I am a wretched man. Go away from me. And he too is saved, not by any work that he did. But let's take a closer look at that. Let's take a closer look 
at how this, how this went out. So Peter, Peter's been fishing all night. Now this man, is a, he's a professional fisherman. He is extremely experienced, extremely talented, and extremely knowledgeable about the craft of fishing. And he's been doing it all night and hasn't caught a thing. He knows the fish, the fish they're not biting. It's not happening today. The nets are coming up empty. He's been pulling nets all night, nothing's happening. And he hears Jesus' teaching, and Jesus says, go out into the deep water. And he is so confident in his knowledge and his craft that he argues. He says, no, we've been doing this all night. We've been doing this all night. We haven't caught anything. But I recognize that there's something special about you because of the words you've been sharing today. I'll do that. I'll do that. Let's go to the deep water, and we'll cast the nets. Now, you know that Peter is still, in his mind, banking on his wisdom, his knowledge of the craft, knowing that those nets are coming up empty. And he throws that net out. And you can see, you can imagine, if you've, if you've done something over and over and over again all night, his muscles are completely memorized to this pull of nothing. All night, every single one, nothing. So you can imagine, to, to, to Peter's astonishment, when he grabbed on that net and expected to pull nothing, and every muscle in his back lit up like a Christmas tree. Bang! That net's full. I bet it probably almost pulled him in, to be honest. He was sure that net was going to be empty, and when it came up and it was full, he had to have been astonished. And he was. He recognized that there was something very special about what was happening here because everything in his mind, every bit of his experience said, this should not be happening, and it is. Partners, come out here. You've got to see this. And they're both filled too. And it just kept coming and coming and coming. And Peter is having this incredible experience where he's like, this should not be happening. And when he puts two and two together, at that moment where he's run dry, he's ragged, these boats are sinking with fish, he has, a, he has that moment where it s switches for him. And he recognizes what really just happened. He, he was standing before the Lord God Almighty. What he just saw was not of this world. And in that moment, he forgot about the fish. Now it's just him and Jesus. Him and what, how he recognizes as at least something from God. This man said, go out and do this. And even though I knew it wasn't going to work, it did. And you see Peter's response right away. He recognizes his human condition, and he's humbled in it too. He falls to Jesus' knees. He says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He recognizes he's got a problem. I'm a sinful man, God. Go away from me. You are too good to be in my presence. We have a problem. And in that moment, we see Jesus respond. Jesus comforts him. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Peter. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to punish you. Don't be afraid. And then he commands him, from now on, I'm going to make you fish for people. I've got plans for you, Peter. And they involve something greater than this. He comforts Peter, recognizing that Peter's got a problem. And in this situation, Jesus, rightly, rightly so, could have punished Peter for his example, or punished him for his, his wretchedness. Instead, comforts him and said, don't be afraid. In that moment, he's saying, you're forgiven. Don't be afraid. You have nothing to be afraid of with me. I love you. And I've got plans for you. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And they obeyed. Peter obeys. When we saw Isaiah, Isaiah jumped right at the opportunity. Here I am, send me, Lord, I want to be your representative. Peter, 
I love this example. I love what they say. So they pulled their boats up to shore and left everything and followed him. Recognize what's going on here. Peter also, as an experienced fisherman, recognizes the vast amount of wealth that is sitting in his boat right now. He just made the catch of a lifetime. Cha-ching. It's payday. All I do is pull, the, pull these boats in and go sell that fish. And he leaves everything. Jesus says, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of man. And Peter didn't hesitate. Pulled the boats ashore, left the fish, left his friends, left, left his equipment, everything. Left his company, if you will, and a massive payday and followed Christ from that day forward. That's the magnitude of this encounter he had with Jesus Christ, recognizing that he had just been saved by the Lord God Almighty himself in the flesh. He left everything he had, everything he'd worked for, a massive payday, and followed Jesus. And not only did he spend some really wonderful times ministering with Jesus, but then after Jesus was gone, he went on and would be used by God to set up the first church, to see thousands saved. Thousands come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to be reconciled to the Father and set up the first church, as detailed in Acts. Thousands saved right away, and they continued to minister, and the gospel continued to spread. Churches continued to be planted and started because, arguably, of this one exchange he had with Jesus Christ in a boat that day where he recognized that an unclean man sitting before the Lord was saved and he had nothing to do with it. Well, let's move on to Paul's encounter. Paul is my favorite encounter with Christ. I remember the first time I heard about Saul becoming Paul, and it shook me to my bones. Let's turn to Acts chapter 22, verses 6 through 21. We're going to read a little ways here. The reason why I've chosen this particular piece of scripture, and it, and it is longer in its own right, is because we have a really wonderful opportunity here where we're not reading about the encounter itself, but we're reading about the encounter through the perspective of the man who encountered and that's a really wonderful thing, to be able to see Paul articulate in his own words, his own thoughts, his experience with Jesus Christ. Starting in verse 6, it says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light was, had, had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me, quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know, what I, know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So here we see Paul recounting his days as Saul. 
Saul of Tarsus was a bad man. He was a bad man. If you were a Christian. Well respected among the Pharisees. A devout, devout man of God. But well respected among the Pharisees. He was a man on a mission. Paul, or, or at the time Saul, he was... Um, he was eager to do the work here. He saw it as the work of the Lord. He saw this as God's work. He wanted to be the muscle. He wanted to be the muscle of, uh, of the Pharisees at that point to rid the church of these Christians, to wipe away this problem. He was so eager, in fact, if in verses 4 and 5 earlier, he, he actually volunteered. He says, I volunteered to go. I volunteered to go to Damascus. He even martyred Stephen. He volunteered to go to Damascus. He was eager to go to Damascus because he had heard that there were Christians there and he was eager to go deal with that problem. He was so eager that he's recounting even now that he says, I, I was bad. I, I, I was persecuting your people. I stood by in approval. I stood by in approval as Christians. Your people were being drugged out of their houses. Mothers, fathers, drug out of their houses and killed. Because they love you, Lord. I stood by in approval as your dear Stephen was killed. I guarded the clothes. I watched it happen in approval. Now, I don't know why God chose to have Stephen martyred when he did. God had a plan for it. But it was so remarkable that Paul even remembered it, recounting, hey, this, this happens. This is a real deal. But even he could not remain unchanged when he had an encounter with, with the Lord. When he encountered Jesus Christ, even Saul couldn't be unchanged. So he's on the road. He's blinded. Jesus knew it was going to take something significant to wake this man up. So much so that he literally blinded him blinded him and then spoke one-on-one -on -one with him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What do I do? Saul says, what do I do? Because he's recognizing he has a human condition problem here too. Because he's recognized he's been on the wrong side of this team. He's been on the wrong side of this fight now. What do I do? And Jesus tells him, get up. You're blind, but get up. Go into this town. You'll receive your sight, and you'll find out what you're to do next. Now, fortunately, Saul had some companions there to lead with. It's not like Saul was blinded right next to Ananias' house. He was out in the middle of nowhere, blinded. If he was by himself, he'd have wandered around for days and probably died. But he had people with him. And during, you can imagine that incredibly powerless moment where he's blind in the middle of nowhere. And he's like, oh, now what do I do? But he has people carry him or, or lead him in to town where he meets up with Ananias. And in an instant, Ananias says, you can see again. And he sees. At that moment, Saul knew he was real, dealing with the real deal. He says, what do I do next? And Ananias says, you've been chosen to go bring the gospel. And Paul, right, Saul right, now, right away, he sees that there's a problem with that. He's, I, these people know me. They watched me. They watched me kill their family and friends. They've heard about me. I've made quite the reputation for myself. That is not going to work. He says, no, go. You need to leave now. He's warned. His life saved in this very moment, saved, says, you need to go now. 
and leave. And I will send you and you will be my representative to the Gentiles. He becomes Paul and he goes from town to town sharing the gospel, starting churches, seeing disciples. And Paul was the first one to see the Holy Spirit come on and people be saved who were not God's chosen people, but were Gentiles. He became a witness back to, in fact, the fellow believers who at that time didn't think anybody was actually going to get saved if they weren't, in fact, a Jew. So without Paul and taking this mission, having experienced this encounter with Christ, had Paul not done that, you yourself would not be saved. Sure, God would have used somebody else that would have set up the church, but we know that the way this went down, Paul, God used Paul specifically to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm not one of God's chosen people because Paul answered the call and took the gospel to the Gentiles. I was able to receive it thousands of years later and be saved. Not only that, but we recognize that the vast majority of this New Testament that you read, love, study, God's word was from Paul. The vast majority of the words that you study for the rest of your life are from this one man. A profound impact on the world. Arguably, pro arguably one of the most profound New Testament Christians in all history. And it all started when he had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with his Lord Jesus Christ and recognized that he had a problem and he needed to be saved. In all three of those circumstances, you see a man who's broken have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with God Almighty and what kind of effect it had on their lives when they recognized they were saved and it had nothing to do with them. Now, I personally had an encounter with Christ myself. No, I wasn't blinded. No, I didn't hear God's you know, Jesus speak to me directly or anything, but I had my own personal encounter. I can remember when I had that moment where I shook, trembled all the way down into my very being when I recognized there was something significant about this Jesus man. As I mentioned, I got saved in 2005. I was in college. I was going to college in um, a small town near Cedar Rapids, and I had spent... Um, most of my life having a conflicted relationship with God at that. Um, when I was younger, I went to a, a Baptist camp and saw the gospel diagram uh, saying, you are my all in all. I love that song. And, you know, responded to the altar call, went and prayed, had a, had a man share the gospel with me. And he told me on that day, he said, you are saved. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. And don't you dare question that. Don't you dare question whether or not you're saved. You will always be saved. Now, I know that's some really rock-solid truth, but I missed the point before I got to the don't ever question you're saved. And after that, I spent my life back and forth, one foot in the church, one foot in the world, and eventually just both feet in the world. By the time I got to college, I had a very conflicted relationship with God. In fact... I had had a couple of disappointing things, and in my pride, I used to walk around telling people, I will not serve this God you serve until he personally apologizes for burning me. I used to be that arrogant. I'm so fortunate that God is a forgiving God. And uh, I had gotten wrapped up in fraternity life, and, and uh, I had given my life, most of my life, to drugs and alcohol, and fornication, and, and I was just, uh, just a dreadful downward spiral. I was going nowhere. And uh, at the, at, in fact, it got to the point where I, I was really going to the bars almost every night, uh, drinking myself to the point where I was hoping that I wouldn't wake up the next day. I was, I was, in, I was in a hurting way. And <clears throat> at that point, I clearly uh, needed help, and my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, she had gone to a church 
knew, knew, uh, knew, uh, knew Kurt Jurgensmeyer and said, hey, you know what, I don't know what our life's going to be like, but let's go sit down with this man. I think he can help. And on 4th of July in 2005, Kurt was willing to take time out of his holiday with his family to sit down with a broken man, arrogant and foolish. And I sat there and tried to spit as much God knowledge as I could at him, and he, he just responded with one, one, one piece of sage advice. He says, you need, to, you need to experience the grace of Jesus Christ. That's it. I didn't have any idea what he meant. <laughs> but I kept coming to church and uh, kept learning a little bit more and a little bit more. And then I had a remarkable experience. I had recognized, well, let me share the verse first. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 through 11 was my moment, my encounter with Christ. Romans chapter 6. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruined by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, what I understood from the gospel from my younger days was that Jesus didn't, you know, that, that Jesus died for my sin, and, and, and I, I didn't have to feel bad for my sin any longer. I, I didn't have to feel bad for being a sinner. That's basically what I understood. And that's not necessarily wrong, but it wasn't enough to change me. It wasn't enough to really speak to me. It wasn't enough to grip me. Later, I'd recognize part of the reason why is because I just really wasn't saved. The fact of the matter is, is that I wasn't saved when I was a kid. I had a wonderful emotional experience, but I did not get saved. I didn't really recognize who Jesus Christ was. And it wasn't until 2005, a broken man, I recognized who Jesus Christ was. And I recognized that my response was, I want to be the man he wants me to be. And at that point, when I read this verse, I had this encounter with Christ where I recognized Jesus didn't die so that I could not, so that I could just not feel bad about being a sinner anymore. Jesus died to truly separate me from what I had done and from what I deserved. You see, what we see here in Romans 6 is that the old self, the old person, the sinner depraved, the broken man, was crucified with Christ on the cross, separating us from them. Quite literally, in your Christian life, you Christian, when you continue to struggle with sin, when you continue to, to buy into sin and go after it, you're pulling that person from the cross and carrying them on your shoulder. Because that makes a lot of sense. But that's what we do. We have a hard time separating ourselves from our human condition because grace blows our minds that much. Grace does not make sense to us in our human condition. We just have a hard time believing that all the bad things we did can be forgiven and we didn't have to do anything about it. We didn't have to do anything to deserve that. When we, when Jesus was crucified, he was covered in our sin. He was covered in all my sin. And not only all my sin today and yesterday, but all my sin tomorrow. That's the magnitude of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And what I recognized was I didn't have to, I didn't have to carry that junk around with, any, with me anymore. Every horrible thing I did, every horrible thing I ever said to anybody, I didn't have to go back and make, make amends with every single one of those things. Uh, I didn't have to go find a burnt offering. Like, I didn't have to do any of that. 
And not only did I not have to feel bad about those things, but it was not me. I believe that so much that, in fact, I've told people from my past, when they start bringing those things up, I say, I'm sorry, I don't know the person you're talking about. And they look at me like I'm crazy, but, but it gives me an opportunity to explain. That's not who I am anymore. And I refuse to be that person anymore. And that's the kind of effect that having an encounter on Christ, having an encounter Christ with Christ had on me. And from that moment on, I had decided I was going to do everything I could to give the rest of my life to this man. And I haven't stopped since. On that day, I have every single day I recognize it's one step closer that I get to Jesus Christ and one step further away I get from that man I used to be. And if you're not living in that truth, Christian, you need to get there. Life is good over here. It's hard, but it's good over here. Quite literally, I mean that. When you continue to cling on to the sins in your life that you struggle with, you literally are ripping that corpse off the cross. You're li ripping that person off the cross who's dead, who's been done away with, and dragging them along in your life. That will wear you down. That will will stop you. Do away with it, Christian. It's not you anymore. And if you haven't experienced Jesus Christ yet, then there's a place on the cross for that person too. And he's meant to be there. And you can put him there. You can put him there today. You can put him there now. That's where it belongs. And I haven't turned back. I haven't. Years later, I, you know, right away I deactivated from my fraternity, started going to church, um, getting involved as best I could, recognized that I had a relationship, an immoral relationship with a girl, and it was either get in or get out, so we got married. Because I loved that girl too much to let her go. So, so we got married. And our, all our college friends looked, like, looked at us like we were crazy, but that's worked out so far. I'm doing okay. Nine years later, or four children later, I'm doing all right. I've been involved in campus ministry. I've been involved in a church plant. I've been fortunate, honored, blessed enough to be a pastor and have people call me pastor and follow me, as crazy as that is. But God's got a hold of my life, and I just can't let go. I'm telling you what, responding to this mission is the most exciting thing you can do on this side of heaven. For those of us who have encountered Christ, here is where he sent you. Here is where he sent you. Isaiah said, here I am, send me. This is the mission he gave us in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, we see the Great Commission. Jesus says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on an earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus' vision and mission for the life of every person who claims to follow him is this. That's it. It's not to go to church on Sunday. It's not to read your Bible every day. It's not to pray five times a day. Those are all good disciplines of this life. But this is it. Every day, being Christ's representative in this world. It could be your spouse. It could be your coworkers. It could be your friends. It could be your children. It could be your children's children. Every single day to be a representative with Christ. Don't feel shame if you're not the most talented evangelist. Don't feel shame if you go through a whole day and you didn't minister the gospel word by word, line by line. Don't, no. Get the picture. The big picture is to be Christ's representative, to show his love to humankind every single day because we are filled, this world is filled with people who have not recognized their human condition and it causes them pain every day. This is our mission. Seek to share your faith. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not that cold turkey evangelism kind of guy. Those people are brilliant and they're built for it. I'm talking about seek to share your faith 
in loving ways through the loving kindness of a human being. Because I believe that if you, in this world right now, the most, the most uh, effective way to make an impression on somebody is to show somebody who doesn't love them or who doesn't deserve it that you love them, that you care about them. It speaks in this world. This world, dire, it just direly needs it. In closing, I'd ask that, you, that we reflect on these encounters with Christ. In each case, Christ, Jesus took a crooked man, he took a broken vessel, and he redeemed his life, and he gave him a purpose. He sent them on a mission for God. And you also note that these men didn't refuse because they had recognized what just happened. It's my opinion that if we truly encounter Christ in a life-changing way, then we will have an increased heart for God's mission in this world. For all of us, I'd recommend that we spend some serious time with our Savior. Read about Him. Pray to Him. Get to know Him. And see where our hearts go. I spend every day trying to serve God as best I could, not because I think it'll make me anything better than I am right now, but solely because he saved this crooked, this wretched man who didn't deserve it. I'm going to spend the rest of my life honoring that gesture as best I can. And I believe if we do this, if we spend more time getting to know our Savior Jesus Christ, I believe we'll increase our desire to be like Isaiah, having an eager, send me type attitude to go on mission for him and love broken people like Jesus does, like Jesus loved us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I do just thank you for this opportunity to love you, to learn about you, to know you. God, I thank you for every single Christ encounter in this room. I know, God, that if I spent the next several days sitting down with every single one of these people, I would hear some incredible stories about how you, Jesus, encountered these people in a real way, and it changed their lives forever. And I pray for every single person in here that has had that experience that they remember it today. And it brings such a source of encouragement, excitement for you. I pray that every person in this room who doesn't have a Christ-like encounter, have a Christ encounter, every single person in here who's sitting there thinking, you know what? I don't know if I've met Jesus like that. That you grab hold of him today, God. I have to believe at least, God, that if they're sitting in church on Sunday, that you are drawing them into your presence. You want to encounter them in that way. Help us to recognize our need for a Savior. Help us to recognize that we got one in a big way. Help us to recognize that every day, God, you are rooting for us. Help us to be on mission for you. Because you love us, you saved us, you care about us, and you're for us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.